Welcome to World Affairs Today, brought to you by the World Affairs Council, Washington, D.C., a leading forum for global education and international affairs. Good evening. My name is Ambassador William Courtney. I'm on the Board of Directors of the World Affairs Council of Washington, D.C. I'd like to welcome you here this evening. This will be a particularly uh, exciting discussion. Uh, Rajiv uh, Chandrasekharan has uh, written a book uh, which Little America, the War Within the War for Afghanistan, which has become one of the most widely discussed books in uh, Washington, uh, really in, in recent years. Uh, Rajiv is a senior correspondent and associate editor at the Washington Post. He has served as bureau chief in Baghdad, Cairo, and Southeast Asia. From 2009 to 2011, he reported on the war in Afghanistan for the Post, traveling extensively through the southern provinces of Helmand and Kandahar to report on the impact of President Obama's decision to double U.S. force levels. He is also the author of Imperial Life in the Emerald City, Inside Iraq's Green Zone, an international best-selling account of the troubled American effort to reconstruct Iraq. His work has won three Overseas Press Club awards. Rajiv obtained a political science degree from Stanford University, where he was editor-in-chief of the Stanford Daily. Let me quote briefly from the reviews of his book to give you some idea of how it's been received thus far. First, a uh, review by Linda Robinson in the New York Times. Little America is a beautifully written and deeply reported account of how a divided United States government and its dysfunctional bureaucracy have foiled American efforts abroad, this time to suppress the Taliban insurgency and bring stability to Afghanistan. No doubt most readers of this book will come away with the conclusion that our principal enemy in all this is ourselves. The second review is by Tony Perry in the Los Angeles Times. He writes <coughs> that Rajiv asserts that the Marines in the surge went to Helmand province rather than the strategically more important area of Kandahar because they did not want to share battle space with the U.S. Army. Thus, the surge of troops ordered by President Obama in 2009 was a missed opportunity because, among other reasons, most of the troops were sent to the wrong place. Rajiv also points out that the late Ambassador Richard Holbrook, a seasoned diplomat, wanted the United States to cut a deal with the Taliban, but his abrasiveness and raging ego alienated everyone whose cooperation he needed, including Vice President Joe Biden. Now let's uh, get the real deal, real deal, and hear from Rajiv himself. Thank you. Thanks for that very kind introduction. It's great to be here in D.C. Um, I, I want to start out by admitting to all of you that I really didn't want to write this book. When I set out for my first trip to Afghanistan in early 2009, I assumed that, that if there was a book to be written about this war, it would be about how President Obama and his team managed to reverse years of strategic drift and neglect and turn around a failing war how they managed to snatch victory from the proverbial jaws of defeat. And after spending two years in Iraq watching President Bush's team try to rebuild that country and sending, um, in many cases, young 20-somethings who were chosen more for their political fidelity than their nation-building expertise, uh, they were, some of them were asked, for instance, for their views on matters such as Roe versus Wade and capital punishment before they were allowed to board planes to Baghdad, I expected Team Obama to show us what would happen when the pros are put in charge. I wasn't thinking we'd get peace a la Germany or Japan after World War II, and certainly not the Jeffersonian democracy that the neocons thought they could 
birth in Iraq. But I was hopeful that the United States and its NATO allies would be able to return Afghanistan to where it was in late 2001 and early 2002, when the Taliban were on the run and a brighter future seemed a certainty. When I was on that first trip in early 2009, the president decided to send 17,000 additional troops to the war front. You know, for Obama, Afghanistan had been the good war, the war that began with two fallen towers, not the war that began from or stemmed from faulty intelligence and exaggerated claims of WMD. In 2007, then Senator Obama had declared Afghanistan the war that has to be won. He pledged at the time to deploy more troops and increase reconstruction funds. He vowed not to repeat the mistakes of the past when we turned our back on Afghanistan. Obama's advisors assumed that that first tranche of 17,000 troops would satisfy the Pentagon. And soon after approving that increase, the president signed off on a strategy document intended to guide the use of those forces and those that were already on the ground. The president made it clear that his aims in Afghanistan and in Pakistan were going to be clear and focused. To, to, and, and, and the key sentence in, in that document was the U.S. was going to focus on disrupting, dismantling, and defeating al-Qaeda in both Afghanistan and Pakistan. But the plan to achieve that goal was going to be fairly expansive. Instead of focusing simply on killing or capturing top al-Qaeda leaders, the White House plan envisaged building an Afghan state that was going to be strong enough to prevent and stable enough to prevent any al-Qaeda leaders from decamping from their sanctuaries in Pakistan and crossing back over to the border in Afghanistan and finding a degree of support there to reestablish bases of operations and training camps. Well, to do that, it involved doing what the Americans should have done back in 2001, building an Afghan government, training a new Afghan army, and providing essential services to the Afghan people. But by then, with the Taliban in control of large swaths of the country, pulling it off was going to be far, far more complicated and costly than it would have been back in 2002 or 2003. To do so, the Pentagon argued that it would have to implement a counterinsurgency strategy. COIN, as the military calls it, concentrates not on hunting down guerrillas, but on using your military resources to essentially protect the civilian population from insurgents. The idea is to separate the good from the bad and focus on the good, uh, reasoning that by protecting that population, you deprive the insurgency of the popular support it needs to sustain itself and to expand. But counterinsurgency requires resources, and it requires time. Protecting civilians means ensuring law and order, providing basic services such as education and health care, setting up government operations, mentoring local security forces, and rebuilding infrastructure. It sounded ambitious, and it sure was. But Afghanistan was the good war, and the price tag didn't seem all that high to the White House. Obama thought that he had already paid for most of it with the 17,000 troops that he had approved. Of course, as you all know, that wasn't enough for the military. The new top commander in Kabul, General Stan McChrystal, would soon ask the president for 40,000 more troops. In an assessment he sent the White House shortly after taking command, McChrystal warned that if NATO forces failed to reverse Taliban momentum within 12 months, defeating the insurgency might no longer be possible. The status quo, he warned, will lead to failure. McChrystal's request led to sticker shock in the White House. All of a sudden, the coin strategy that the president had so quickly approved soon after taking office now had a new price tag, more than 100,000 total U.S. troops on the ground. As a result, the president convened a series of lengthy discussions with his war cabinet in the Situation Room of the White House to discuss this, this latest troop request. Those in uniform, General McChrystal, General Dave Petraeus, then the head of the Central Command, and Admiral Mike Mullen, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all argued that there was a need for more forces in Afghanistan. They insisted that COIN and a troop surge was what had turned around Iraq and arrested the worst violence of the Civil War. And there was some truth to that, although the real reasons for the turnaround in Iraq were far more complex and nuanced than simply the addition of U.S. forces. But in Afghanistan, it was, it was an even greater complexity because counterinsurgency didn't simply involve separating warring parties in a civil war, as was the case in Iraq. 
In Afghanistan, it involved something far more complicated, which was trying to convince the majority ethnic Pashtun population to cast their lot with President Hamid Karzai's government instead of with the insurgency. The problem was that Karzai's government was often far more rapacious and corrupt than the Taliban. How could coin work when the locals were turning to the insurgents to protect them from their supposed protectors? Coin also required patience. It can take years before a besieged population feels safe enough to demonstrate allegiance to their nation. But military commanders downplayed those risks and costs. Civilians in President Obama's war cabinet were not immediately sold on McChrystal's plan. Chief among them was Vice President Joe Biden, who doubted Karzai's sincerity and the Pakistani's, Pakistani government's willingness to crack down on insurgent sanctuaries on its own soil. Instead, Biden argued, the military should focus more of its existing resources in the country on pursuing Taliban leaders and any al-Qaeda operatives who were foolish enough to try to sneak back into Afghanistan from the safety of Pakistan. In discussions in the White House Situation Room, Biden emerged soon as the most vocal skeptic of the coin proposal. He was unmoved by McChrystal, Petraeus, and Mullen's arguments. And he kept questioning the rationale for additional forces. In my reporting for this book, I obtained a memo that Biden wrote directly for the president, spelling out his concerns about the counterinsurgency strategy. And I'd like to read it to you, or at least part of it. I do not see how anyone who took part in our discussions could emerge without profound questions about the viability of counterinsurgency. Our military will do its part. They will clear anything we ask them to clear. They will hold anything we ask them to hold. But no one can tell you with conviction when, and even if, we can produce the flip sides of coin that are required to build and transfer responsibility to the Afghans, an effective and sustainable civilian surge, a credible partner in Kabul, basic governance and services, and competent Afghan security forces. We simply can't control these variables, yet they're essential to the success of COIN. In the end, as we all know, Obama sided with his commanders. He decided to give them almost all of what they wanted, 30,000 more troops. Although the surge did come with a key condition, the most significant was that the troops would have to start coming home in 2011, two years from the, the point at which he had approved the surge. It was a deadline that he took from the military's own planning documents, which stated that U.S. troops could clear areas of insurgents and then transfer responsibility for those areas to Afghan security forces within 18 to 24 months. A month later, I was sitting in my office at the Washington Post, preparing for a trip to accompany the U.S. Marines, the first wave of those surge forces, as they prepared to assault a Taliban stronghold in southern Afghanistan called Marja. It was a nasty place. There were hundreds of insurgents holed up there, bomb-making factories. Um, many of the fields were growing opium-producing poppies. Um, it was a real cancer in southern Afghanistan. And as I was getting my stuff together, I went on my computer and went onto Google Earth, and I pulled down a satellite image of Marja, this place that I would be going to in a week or two. And I noticed something very odd. I had traveled around Afghanistan a fair bit, and, you know, there most people live in sort of mud-walled huts. Farmlands you know, have very sort of meandering borders, nothing really demarcated with the aid of any modern surveying technology. Doesn't look anything like the Midwest with sort of very clear 90-degree borders to farm plots. I looked at it, and I noticed this very odd thing, these sort of razor-sharp north-south seemed to be canals or roads, and, and, and they were sort of straight arrow as the avenues of Manhattan. I'm like, well, this is odd. I wonder what it is. I wound up sort of digging around, and of course, like many things, the, the answer was found on the internet without too much digging. And then as I sort of dug a little bit more and, and asked people in this town about it, I, I discovered that there was a story here, a story suffused with relevant lessons for our current attempt at nation building there. But it was a story, it seemed, that few in Washington had bothered to read about, to understand, to connect the dots. It's a story that begins, quite remarkably, with the Holocaust. In the mid-1930s and late 30s, 
Jewish fur traders escaping the advances of the Nazis in Central Europe, those who could flee, many of them wound up coming to the United States. Many of them settled in New York. And they needed a new source for furs to, to make coats and hats and such. And so they turned to Afghanistan, of all places, whose hills abounded with the Persian fat-tailed sheep. And the newborn fleece of those sheep um, could be turned into lustrous coats and hats. And so in the late 30s and early 40s, Afghanistan exported between one and two million caracol wool pelts a year to the United States. Because of currency exchange controls imposed by the king in Kabul, the sale of each of those pelts put a couple of dollars in the king's treasury. So at the end of World War II, as Europe was digging out of its rubble, Afghanistan was sitting on a comparative windfall. It had $100 million in gold and silver reserves in its treasury. And so the 32-year-old king in Kabul, Mohammad Zahir Shah, who had been very impressed with what the United States had done during the Depression with the Tennessee Valley Authority, thought that he could vault his primitive landlocked nation into the modern era uh, by, by, by an ambitious public works project. And he thought, perhaps, that they could harness the raging waters of the Hindu Kush mountains and transform a barren desert in southern Afghanistan along the Helmand River into a verdant agricultural oasis to turn it into a breadbasket that would feed his country. And so, in 1946, the royal government hired the American construction firm Morrison Knudsen. They're a now defunct company, but back then, they had just finished building the Hoover Dam and the San Francisco Bay Bridge, and they would soon go on to build Cape Canaveral. And so the Afghans hired dozens of American engineers. This wasn't a foreign aid project. They had the money to do it. They, they wrote a check to the Americans. The Americans came into southern Afghanistan and set out to build a network of irrigation canals uh, that would feed brand new farms that would be uh, run by nomads who were going to be resettled in new communities. Um, soon, this project turned into something more than just trying to build new farms. The Afghan king, a few years earlier, had sent a small number of, of uh, young Afghan men to the United States to attend college and graduate school. And they'd come back and they'd become advisors to the king. And, and they, they saw in this project a chance to bring the America that had dazzled them in their school days to Afghanistan. They wanted to build these new villages with modern schools and health clinics. As they resettled nomads, they wanted families from different tribes to live next to one another rather than in separate villages. Uh, they wanted to educate girls and have women cast off the head-to-toe burqa. Eye for an eye Islamic justice would, re would, pardon me, would be replaced with written laws and august courts. Professional government men from Kabul would supplant the gray-bearded elders who wielded power in the provinces. It was going to be a grand social engineering experiment as well. And those English-speaking, suit-wearing Afghans who had the king's ear saw in these American engineers the ideal partners to transform their nation. But unfortunately, this lush agrarian vision soon ran aground. It turns out that the soil down in the Helmand River Valley is very salty. And below the, the soil on the surface is this sort of almost impermeable layer of crust uh, that's, that, that the water doesn't really drain through. Think of the Helmand River Valley as a giant planter box with no holes in it. And when the Afghans watered their fields, and they have a tendency to flood their fields, not just to do drip irrigation, water pooled on the surface. And when that water evaporated, it left even more salts in the soil that really stunted anything that was what they tried to grow there. Well, when, when, when the king developed reservations about this project, the American contractor's response wasn't to sort of pack up and, and go home and say this can't be done, but instead it, it was to convince the Afghans that they really just needed to embrace a bigger project. Instead of just digging canals, they needed to build a bunch of dams in the upriver hills and a big reservoir. Now, before doing all of this, a standard prerequisite was to do some soil and drainage studies. The Afghans 
despite some of these earlier warnings, kind of blew it off, and the American contractor wasn't about to, to pressure the Afghans into doing these studies. Everybody simply thought this project was too big to fail, but it wasn't. Soon, those new settlers wound up living in tents as opposed to these new villages that everybody hoped would be created. The American engineers had also been living in tents, but they thought that perhaps they could get started on the other part of the social engineering experiment and get themselves out of their uncomfortable accommodation. So soon, smack dab in the middle of the desert of Helmand Province, this new town rose, eight square blocks. And instead, if any of you have seen pictures of Afghan homes in National Geographic, you know that every single dwelling in that country is surrounded by a tall brick or mud wall to prevent you know, people from gazing in at the women folk inside the house. Well, in this town, no walls. Suburban-style ranch homes and bungalows with white stucco walls. Manicured green front lawns. They set up the country's first and only co-ed high school. A swimming pool where boys and girls swam together. A clubhouse where there were nightly card games, weekly square dances, and a bartender who poured gin and tonics. It was a bit of America, dropped into the Afghan desert. The American engineers thought that the Afghans would look at this and aspire to create similar villages for themselves. Well, to the Afghans, this was fine for the Americans, but it was certainly not something that they wanted for themselves, certainly not co-ed schools and swimming pools. But they did come up with a name for the place, Little America, and that's where I get the title for my book. Um, well, unfortunately, despite a lot of hard work by the contractor, the problems with the irrigation project simply couldn't be resolved. And by the late 50s, the Afghans said thank you, but no thank you to Morrison Knudsen, sent them on their way. Well, back in Washington, this caused a lot of concern. In fact, it caused concern for the American embassy in, in Kabul, which was sending cables back to Washington warning of potential dangers if this project was left unfinished. The principal concern was that the Soviets, who were active in northern Afghanistan at the time, would swoop down into the south, take up the projects to finish them, and gain a critical foothold in the southern part of the country, getting them perilously close to American allied Pakistan. So in 1961, the US government, under the administration of President Kennedy, uh, sent the newly created U.S. Agency for International Development to fix this problem. And USAID sent dozens of its own engineers to Afghanistan to try to fix the problems that were caused by the contractor and by uh, soils that, that, that simply were not uh, compatible with, with growing stuff. Um, and, and soon these USAID engineers discovered a real a fatal flaw in this project. The main canal had been built too low, and because the farm fields weren't flat, the water continued to pool. So they thought, look, you know, maybe what we could do is move the Afghans off the land, flatten the land to improve runoff, and then we'd invite the farmers back onto their land. Seemed to be a simple and obvious solution. So we brought in dozens and dozens of bulldozers. To the Afghans, this was very concerning. They worried that if they left their land, they'd never get it back. So when the American bulldozers arrived, the villagers met them with rifles. And thus began a more than 10-year uh, process of Americans trying to come up with solutions only to find them foiled, either because they were culturally incompatible or technically infeasible. And so by the early 1970s, funding ran out, patients ran out, and USAID left, project was ended. Well, a couple months later, then Secretary of State Henry Kissinger happened to visit Kabul, and the Afghan Prime Minister complained to him about this project in the Helmand River Valley. He called it an unfinished symphony. And so Kissinger demanded that the bureaucracy send people back to Afghanistan to try to fix this problem. And this time, the call went out to a small federal agency called the U.S. Soil Conservation Service. And it sent a couple of experts out to Afghanistan. And these guys actually wound up coming up with a maddeningly simple but potentially effective solution. They said, you know, instead of big bulldozers and re-engineering this, why don't we give the Afghans a bunch of hand tools and teach them how to dig some basic drainage ditches by hand? Obvious. Employ lots of people. And on the first farms they did this on, farm yields increased by 75%. They'd finally found a solution. But then, before they could expand this across the valley, there was a communist coup in Kabul. And the following year, 
Soviet tanks rolled into Afghanistan. We'd finally found a solution to the problems that had bedeviled us for years, but it was simply too late. Had senior officials at the White House and the Pentagon and the State Department, USAID, bothered to understand any of this history back in 2009, it might have given them pause in advocating another grand attempt at nation building in Afghanistan. But instead, our government barreled forward with a strategy that had a minuscule chance of working. In my book, I dissect the American approach to stabilizing Afghanistan on two levels. The first is strategically, that is, was the coin strategy and the surge the right decision? The second is, is operationally, that is, once the president signed off on the surge and the coin strategy, how well did the organs of our government, the Pentagon, the State Department, USAID, even the president's own White House, how well did they implement his policy? Let's start with strategy. And let me state up front that I believe COIN can work if the conditions are right and the cost is merited. But for COIN to have prevailed in Afghanistan, several things needed to break our way. The Afghan government had to be a willing partner. The Pakistani government had to be willing to crack down on insurgent sanctuaries on its soil. The U.S. government had to be willing to commit troops and money for years on end. And the American people had to be patient enough for security to improve gradually. And finally, the Afghan army had to be ready and willing to assume control of areas that had been cleared of insurgents by American troops. First, let's talk about the Afghan government. President Hamid Karzai never agreed with America's war strategy. You know, American military officers and diplomats correctly argue that the real reason the insurgency is able to thrive in parts of Afghanistan is not because of religious zealotry. It's because of tribal rivalries an inequitable distribution of power at the local level, and the Afghan government's failure to provide even the most basic services to its population. As a consequence, many Afghans simply turned to the Taliban. Now, back in 2009, the military argued that the solution to this was a comprehensive counterinsurgency campaign to help remedy the Afghan government, to, to create security so that the Afghan government could actually start providing these services to the people so they'd win them back from the Taliban. But in President Hamid Karzai's eyes, the principal problem, he sees it not as the corruption and malfeasance of his government at the local level. He thinks it's all infiltration of militants from Pakistan. Now, it's true. There are militants who are infiltrated from Pakistan. It's a big problem, but it's not the only problem. But to Karzai, everything we were doing in southern and eastern Afghanistan, down there at the village level in the valleys, he saw it as Americans mucking around with essentially a self-regulating system, in his view, of ethnic Pashtun tribal governance. As a senior military commander told me, through all of his flare-ups, Karzai is sending us a message, and that message is, I don't believe in counterinsurgency. Now, the Afghan people had their own reasons to be skeptical of COIN. Contrary to the images that we see on television here, the Afghans have no great love for the Taliban. They view the Talibs as the religious zealots that they are, and they know very well what it was like to live under the draconian rule of the Taliban. But they have no great love for their government either. It's because Karzai's government's filled with thugs, warlords, corrupt scoundrels. They abuse the people, shake them down for bribes, kidnap boys for pleasure. When American troops told the Afghans that their mission wasn't just to improve security, but to bring the Afghan government to these remote villages and valleys, Many residents simply recoiled. Whoa, they said, we may not like the Taliban, but we don't like our government either. And this was a fundamental point that Washington failed to grasp until too late. And what of the Pakistani government? After the Talib leadership relocated to Pakistan in late 2001, they were provided safe harbor by Pakistan's intelligence service, the ISI. Talibs were allowed to meet and reorganize and even reestablish networks inside Pakistan. But back then, Pakistani spies refrained from overt assistance to the Taliban. But by mid-2009, as American surge forces began flooding in to southern Afghanistan, the ISI adopted a far more hands-on strategy, concerned that American gains on the battlefield would hobble the Afghan insurgency. ISI spy masters began interacting far more directly with Taliban commanders, often providing them arms and intelligence via civilian intermediaries. 
According to one estimate, at least half of all insurgent commanders were working closely with the ISI by the spring of 2011. What about the price tag here? Was it worth it? You know, it costs a million dollars to keep one American service member in Afghanistan for just one year. That means that the annual bill for the war was about $100 billion last year. Is achieving a marginally less bad outcome in Afghanistan worth that expense? With other pressing security challenges, Iran, North Korea, the Middle East, I need not say more about that this week. Is it prudent to be tying up so many forces and dispersing so many precious dollars in remote Afghan villages? What about American patients? The surge has exhausted it. The war was in its eighth year when Obama decided to surge. Even though many Americans back then shared the president's view that Afghanistan was the good war, only a slim majority supported the decision to send more troops. Although commanders in chief shouldn't use public opinion polling to guide strategic decision making, public support is essential for any drawn out campaign involving tens of thousands of troops, hundreds of monthly casualties, and almost daily fatalities. Had all the other factors played out differently, had Karzai been a true partner, had the Pakistanis taken on meaningful action against the Taliban, had our nation not been in the throes of economic stagnation, then perhaps the public could have rallied around such a large war effort. But when all of those indicators pointed down, public opinion soon followed. Now even a majority of Republicans believe this war is no longer worth fighting. And lastly, the Afghan army. Instead of compelling Afghan soldiers into action, the surge sent the opposite message. The Afghans often decided to hang back and simply let the Americans do the fighting. What was supposed to be a kick in the pants, or at least a, a golden opportunity to work in tandem with the Americans, turned into a crutch. But lest you think I'm all about the negative here, the Afghan army has emerged as a rare bright spot in this overall effort, despite the recent uptick in green on blue attacks. As American troops have started to leave, the Afghans are stepping up to shoulder more of the fighting. And through it all, the Afghan army, raggedy as it may be, remains the country's most respected institution. If the country hangs together post-2014, it's going to be because of the Afghan army. Now, despite all of the coin assumptions that turned out to be false, our troops have made remarkable progress in the past three years. Parts of southern Afghanistan that were once teeming with insurgents are now largely peaceful. Schools have reopened, as have bazaars. People are living as close to a normal life as possible in places like that. But Afghanistan as a whole is not fully secure. Eastern parts of the country still are in the grip of a Taliban faction backed by Pakistan's intelligence service. And in the South, a critical question lingers. Will the Afghans, will their government, their police force, their army, will they have the willingness and ability to take the baton from American troops as they come home? Will the Afghans sustain the gains? Will the blood and treasure we have expended there have been worth it? Or will it slip back to chaos? That doesn't mean the Talibs, in my view, are going to be able to roll into Kabul with the same ease as they did in the 1990s. I don't think the Kabul government's going to fall like Saigon's did. The Afghan army, it appears, should be able to protect major cities and key roadways and other critical areas. But the insurgents will almost certainly expand control of rural districts, and they'll retain the ability to conduct frequent attacks against government and civilian targets. The foreseeable future, unfortunately, will be messy and chaotic. But many Americans may well see that as simply good enough. Osama's dead. Al-Qaeda's on the ropes. The Talib leadership has taken a beating. But could all of that have occurred without a big surge? Could we have achieved a similar messy but good enough outcome without hundreds more dead and thousands more Americans gravely wounded? Before I take your questions, I want to turn to the matter of how the surge was executed. I've talked about the strategic disconnect. Now I want to address the operational failure. Agree or disagree, the surge was the president's strategy, and the government beneath him had an obligation to make their best efforts to implement it. But each part of our government made critical errors. First off, the Pentagon. Now, Back in 2009, the real prize for the Taliban was the southern city of Kandahar. 
It's the country's second most populous city. It's sort of the spiritual capital for the Taliban. And that, that's the city that they were fighting the hardest to retake. Because if they did, they would have had a springboard to take over much of the rest of the country, as they did in the 1990s. So you would think that the majority of that first wave of forces approved by President Obama in early 2009 would have been sent to the areas in and around Kandahar. But no, they were sent off to neighboring Helmand province. Yes, where we dug those canals six decades ago. But they were sent to a part of Helmand that was home to fewer than 1% of Afghanistan's population, even though the, the strategy was supposed to be about protecting the people. So why? Well, it was all about tribal rivalries, not in Afghanistan, but in the Pentagon. The U.S. Marines, which comprised that force that was going there, that first brigade that was going there, they wanted to bring their own helicopters, their own logistics units. And as a result, it was going to be too complicated to plug them into Kandahar, where there were already American and Canadian Army units fighting. Well, it could have been done had senior commanders wanted to do so, but they chose the path of least resistance, and they sent the Marines out to this part of Helmand with relatively few people and relatively low strategic significance. It took another year before meaningful numbers of U.S. Army soldiers wound up in those critical areas in and around Kandahar. Consequence? We squandered a year of the troop surge. How about the civilian surge? Now, the civilian surge was supposed to be a surge of American diplomats and reconstruction workers who were supposed to flow into the country alongside the military, get down there to those remote districts working side by side with military officers to implement the counterinsurgency strategy, to help build, in many cases, local governments, to provide valuable reconstruction assistance, to, to provide humanitarian aid, uh, to provide a, a, a linkage between the, the, uh, the U.S. military and, and the Afghan civilian population. Unfortunately, the civilian surge wound up unfolding far, far, far too slowly. And they arrived months late, in some cases years late. And when they did, most of the new arrivals wound up staying at the fortified and comfortable embassy compound in Kabul, as opposed to getting out into the field where they were most needed. By late 2010, more than two-thirds of the 1,100 U.S. government civilian employees were stationed in the capital, and many of them were just there to feed a mushrooming bureaucracy that was building up there. Yeah, there were plenty of Afghans in the city with whom to interact and collaborate, but many embassy and USAID staffers were required to sit at their desks at the embassy and perform tasks they could have just as easily done back here in Washington. Now, let me state up front that, I, you know, there were lots of talented and dedicated people who went to Afghanistan for the State Department, USAID, and other government agencies. But from the outset, the civilian surge was bedeviled by a lack of initiative and creativity back here in Washington. Instead of scouring our country for the top talent to fill these critical jobs that were central to the president's national security agenda, those responsible for hiring at AID simply waited for resumes to come in over the transom. Or in some cases, they turned to retirees. We sent an 87-year-old man to the, the uh, reconstruction team. Or pardon me, I, 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 I added a few more years. 79, but still old. A 79-year-old man to the reconstruction team office in Kandahar. Uh, in some cases, you know, we turned to, to contractors who had worked on wasteful projects in Iraq. Um, you know, the result was almost, not quite, but almost as embarrassing as, as the first years of the reconstruction effort in Iraq, which I chronicled in my first book, where, you know, we did things like send a 24-year-old with no background in finance to go to Baghdad with a job of reopening Iraq's stock exchange. Um, in the case of, of Afghanistan, you know, we sent an aid field officer to one district in Helmand who got into a fight with Marines because they wouldn't give her her, her own air-conditioned trailer. In the safest district of Helmand, um, the state simply couldn't hold down uh, a representative there. The first guy came and, and left without uh, explanation after just a few weeks. Uh, same for the second one, but not before admitting to his colleagues that he didn't know the b most basic acronyms for the Afghan security forces. The third guy who came did wind up staying, but only because he had been fired from his job as a town manager in rural Virginia. And then there's the matter of USAID. 
Uh, look, Afghanistan has, di has really dire needs, and it had been starved of reconstruction assistance during the Bush administration. But the Obama administration's response was to simply flood the country with dollars, far more than Afghanistan could reasonably absorb. In 2010, we tried to spend $4 billion in one year on reconstruction and development projects there. You know, in one district of Helmand, that equated to more per person than the annual per capita income for every man, woman, and child there. Not surprisingly, this cash surge wound up exacerbating the very corruption we were trying to reduce. And what about back here in Washington? Well, too often, the president's war cabinet was often at war with itself. One of the biggest, nastiest, most visceral internal fights that I describe in the book uh, involves the feud between the late veteran diplomat Richard Holbrooke and the president's national security advisors in the White House. Now, Holbrooke um, was a guy with, with, a, with a really distinguished resume. You know, he'd started out as a, as a young man working for USAID in the Mekong Delta. At age 27, he was the youngest American to serve on the U.S. delegation to the Paris Peace Talks aimed at ending the Vietnam War. In 1996, he brokered the Dayton Accords, which ended the fighting in the Balkans. He had more experience with war and peace than anybody else at senior levels of the Obama administration. But he also had a giant ego, sharp elbows, um, uh, could be a, a very difficult person to work with, had a real thirst for the spotlight, and he was perhaps the embodiment of drama in President Obama's no drama White House, and this really rankled a lot of people on the National Security Council. So instead of focusing on Holbrooke's virtues, and he had been brought in by Hillary Clinton to, focus, to try to chart a path toward eventual negotiations with the Taliban, reasoning that we were never going to be able to kill every last single Talib. So that the, the way you sort of try to end this conflict was to use the troop surge to leverage potential peace talks. It was a long shot, but he had a record of doing stuff like this, and the hope was that he would find a way to get there. But instead of supporting this initiative, in fact, let me put it differently, the White House supported this goal, but instead of supporting Holbrooke's efforts to try to get there, the White House undercut him at almost every opportunity. At times, they refused to let him use military aircraft to travel to the region. Key meetings were scheduled when he was out of town. They deliberately undercut him in front of President Hamid Karzai and the leadership of Pakistan. Um, as a result, Holbrooke was able to accomplish precious little in, in the last year and a half of his life, which was that, that he spent working uh, on Afghanistan and Pakistan. Um, the failure to really take advantage of Holbrooke, uh, in, in my view, led us to squander the first 18 months of the troop surge. We failed to explore aggressively negotiations to end this war when we had the most boots on the battlefield. You know, although more Americans perished on the beaches of Normandy and in the jungles of Vietnam, Afghanistan stands alone in the annals of American warfare. It's our country's longest war, longer even than the Revolutionary War. It's a forgotten war. With no draft, the fighting's been left to a small cadre of professional officers and volunteer grunts. And it's by far the most complicated war our nation's ever prosecuted. You know, our troops have been told to befriend villagers and bombard insurgents with the same fervor, often in the same day. Commanders have been ordered to fight with fewer forces and in less time than they've wanted. Diplomats and development experts have been required to work in environments that were far more dangerous than they had signed up for. All told, I spent three years observing Americans attempting to defeat the insurgency in Afghanistan. For a long time, I believed that we could pull it off if only we had enough people, money, and patience. But the real challenge wasn't headcounts, budgets, or public opinion. For all the grand pronouncements about waging a new kind of war, our nation was simply unable to adapt. Too few of our generals recognized that surging forces could actually be counterproductive, that the presence of more foreign troops in the Pashtun heartland would be a potent recruiting tool for the Taliban. Too few soldiers were ordered to leave their air-conditioned bases and live among the people in fly-infested villages 
Too few diplomats invested the effort to understand the languages and cultures of the places in which they were stationed. Too few development experts were interested in anything other than making a buck. Too few officials in Washington were willing to assume the risks necessary to forge a lasting peace. And nobody, it seemed, wanted to work together. The good war had turned bad. For years, we, Americans, dwelled on the limitations of the Afghans. We should have focused on ours. Thank you. And uh, now I'm told that if you'd like to ask a question, please come up to that microphone over there. Several years ago, I started reading The Great Game and simultaneously began reading Ahmad Rashid's account of the recent history of Afghanistan. And as I was doing, reading those two books and reading the headlines, all of these things began to form a continuous loop that has continued until this very moment. Um, it, it seems that we, European powers, the Russians, the British, and ourselves, have been trying to impose our notion of a country upon a people who have no interest in unifying within as a nation state. Is there some way in which we can start listening to the people of Afghanistan and ask them what they want and ask them whether they want our assistance in achieving their goals? Well, you know, the Afghan people actually see their country. Many of them do. I'm not saying all of them. But I, but I think a, a significant majority of them see their country as, as, a, as a whole nation state. The, 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 the desire, what you're not seeing as yet, is, it is for, for instance, like, like in the Balkans or in other parts of the world, uh, a desire among certain factions, certain ethnic groups, to want their own independent homelands. You know, you're not seeing the Hazara population say, we want to have the own, our own independent country of Hazarajat. You're not seeing the, the, you know, the, the Turkmen Afghan saying, we want our own, you know, our own republic here. They, they, they do see themselves as part of, you know, the, the unitary nation state of Afghanistan. That said, um, what, they, what they don't see, uh, how should I put this, what they, what they don't necessarily want are foreign powers coming in and telling them how to either run their government or how to um, conduct their affairs. At this, but that said, and I, I recognize I'm, I'm, I'm jumping back and forth here, they are, uh, many of them, keen for uh, foreign assistance. They recognize they live in a very poor country. Uh, they don't have much of an economy to speak of, though there are reports of great mineral wealth under the ground. It's going to take years upon years to really extract that stuff, if, if, if it's even extractable. So they remain wards of the, the international community. Um, but where, you know, for many Afghans, they, 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 they really do want international assistance, humanitarian assistance, uh, civilian development assistance, uh, but they're, they're far more ambivalent about the presence of international forces. Um, you know, and they're torn about this because when you, when you really sort of engage them in depth, they, they do acknowledge that in many cases they see U.S. and NATO forces as honest brokers. They, 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 view, they have no great love for the Taliban, they don't really trust their own government. So on one hand, they, they see the foreign troops as, as perhaps you know, less corrupt and pernicious than, than the other forces that are operating in their country. At the same time, they're prideful people, and they, they don't like the idea of foreign troops on their soil. So they're, they're conflicted and they're torn. Um, but getting back to where you started, yes, you know, great game, foreign powers in the country, the Brits, the Russians, even before the Brits, you know, other occupiers. Um, there's, a, there's a rich history there. And um, we, we never really bothered to, to, to fully engage in it. And, and in part, you know, the, 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 the great journalist Neil Sheehan, who wrote the Pulitzer-winning book about the Vietnam War, Bright Shining Lie, uh, 
um, reviewed my book in the Washington Post. I was, I was thrilled about that. And he, he noted in his review that Americans have a tendency to think of themselves as a historyless people. Uh, that we will go in and, you know, yeah, we're, we're not going to be as stupid as the British were there a, a century ago. We're not going to do what the, the Russians did. Um, you know, these, these lessons don't apply to us because we're, we're here on a, on, a, on a noble mission. We're, we're bringing troops and resources to bear the likes of which the others didn't do. Uh, we're more enlightened about our ways of warfare. And all that's true, but there are important historical lessons there. Um, that we simply have not fully taken into account as we have sought to, to prosecute this war and engage in this nation-building effort. In listening to your presentation of all of the flaws in the formulation of policy and the implementation of policy, for my generation, all I could think about was reading the same thing in David Halberstam's book, The Best and the Brightest. And the parallel struck me as being very strong. So my question to you is, is there a parallel in the end game in Afghanistan? At the end of the day, do we just walk out of there? Well, it's a very, very good question. Um, and there are a lot of people in Washington that are hoping that there is not that same parallel, that we don't, that Afghanistan, look, Afghanistan is never going to be a, 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 a tick, in the, in the victory column for the United States. But can we avoid it from being a clear-cut defeat a la Vietnam and the images of helicopters taking off from the roof of an embassy? And just for all those people who, who do rightly question, you know, Osama's dead. Much of the core al-Qaeda leadership has been eviscerated, largely through CIA-led drone strikes in Pakistan. You know, why are we still there? Why don't we leave tomorrow? Um, now we are on a path to leaving between now and the end of 2014. Uh, for some, that's too slow, but um, what does that path hopefully lead us to? Hopefully it leads to an outcome where an Afghan government and an Afghan army can actually hold on to parts of that country. It's not going to be perfect. Um, there are going to be areas where the Taliban really will expand. Perhaps it gets to a point where the Taliban and the Afghan government engage in some degree of negotiation and find an accommodation. But hopefully it's, it's, it's building up an Afghan government and helping to, to train an Afghan army in the few years left that, that will not get totally overrun. Um, and it comes at a, still at a cost, right? Americans will continue to die for this over the next couple of years, hopefully in far fewer numbers than have died in the past few years. Um, but is it, is it worth it to at least try to increase the chances that Afghanistan either completely falls back into the arms of the Taliban, or more likely the Talib seize the southern and eastern parts of the country and the northerners reconstitute themselves into an alliance and you have another civil war, Kabul is contested, and many, many civilians wind up getting killed, displaced, or otherwise victimized in, in all of this. Um, and so now as we start to enter year 12 of this conflict, you know, what's the American patience level going to be? I, I leave you with, with, with these two thoughts. The first is, when the Soviet, last Soviet tanks rolled out of Afghanistan in 1989, the communist-backed government in Kabul did not fall overnight. It didn't fall a week later or a month later. It fell two years later when the Soviet Union collapsed and Moscow was unable to sustain and fund the government in Kabul. So what happens post-2014 may depend less on the number of American boots on the ground, and more on our willingness to help sustain the Afghan army, to help pay for the operations of the Afghan government, to provide humanitarian aid for the Afghan people. Now, that bill in 2015 could be somewhere between 3 and $5 billion a year. That's a lot of money, more than we give to Israel or Egypt in a given year. Uh, but it's still cheaper than the $100 billion we spent last year. Will the American people 
be willing to support that? Will Congress be willing to support that? Or will we say it's simply too much and walk away? And if we do that, again, you, you, you really increase the chances that, that the insurgency winds up taking over at least a good part of the country and you plunge back into a civil war. Um, if any of you have seen the movie Charlie Wilson's War, the most instructive scene in that movie is the last scene where the Soviets have been defeated and Charlie is sitting in a committee room here in Washington fighting for a million dollars for Afghan schools and can't get it. And I was just going to say, but my point in the parallel with Vietnam is this was what happened in Vietnam too. At a certain point, we st the troops were gone, the money was still flowing, and the money flowing kept the government in power because it provided them with money. And when the U.S. money dried Ran up, out, they failed. And why should we assume that the Karzai government or whatever its successor is can ever be self-sustaining without this bottomless pit of U.S. money? You know, it probably won't be self-sustaining. Anytime in the foreseeable future. Now, I mean, there's some who, who hope that at, at some point uh, mineral mining and, and a few other things might well provide enough capital to sustain that government. I think that's still a bit of a long shot. Um, but it, it all comes down to, a few years from now, the, the cost-benefit trade-off. How many, how many billions of dollars is it worth to prevent that country next door to nuclear-armed Pakistan from, from plunging into yet another civil war, potentially then creating um, uh, white space for transnational terrorist organizations to, to once again uh, set up some base of operations there? Or will we, we be able to find a way to contain that with potentially a small number of follow-on troops and some amount of money that is judged as a sort of investment as a hedge against um, a repeat of the, of the 1990s. And that's going to be a, a discussion that the American people are need, going to need to have, Congress is going to need to have, and whomever's in the White House is going to need to have. And I suppose it's, since we're in an election season, it's, it's worth ending on this point. You know, you raise a very important question. Um, and and it, it, it also sort of leads to that associated question of sort of why are we still there? Why don't we, we leave sooner? And that's a, that's, a, that's a discussion that our political candidates should be having. And I think it's a real shame that neither Mitt Romney nor President Obama really spends an awful lot of time talking about this war. We still have 70,000 men and women in uniform there. We've got thousands of civilians there, working for the State Department, aid, contractors. Um, they and, and we all, given the costs of this now and into the future, deserve an honest discussion of what American strategy is there, and what, what, the, what the end game is there. And we're not really getting it at this point. So, but thank you for that question. Thank you for joining us for World Affairs Today, a production of the World Affairs Council, Washington, DC. Stay connected with us at www.worldaffairstoday.org.